Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jacob Restituto, and I'm a musician from Northport, New York. And today we have the absolute pleasure of having Ross Newbauer on the channel, all the way from LA. Really appreciate you. You have definitely heard, if you're a music fan in the past 10 years, if not longer, you've definitely heard anything he's worked on. He's worked on some pretty sweet hits, so I'm really looking forward to getting into this chat. Really appreciate you taking the time, Ross. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's really wonderful. Absolutely, man. Coming all the way from LA, it's morning for you, it's the afternoon for me, so you're sipping your coffee, I'm sipping, <laughs> I'm about to have my second cup of coffee for today. <laughs> Always. Surprisingly enough, this is my second cup by 11.30, so we, we're, we're cranking. I love it, man, I love it. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. For those that aren't familiar with you and your work, can you give a little backstory on who you are and just a little bit of your history? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, I have come up uh, through a kind of traditional cool route. Uh, really bringing me to where I am right now. I have worked uh, past many years with uh, another mixer, Joe Zook, assisting him, um, worked together on a lot of great records uh, from AJR to Christina Perry to Alicia Cara. Um, and I'm also now in a world of uh, mixing records myself, um, similar names such as Christina Perry, uh, Train, um, and such and such some really cool artists like quarters of change and P the pocket queen and uh I, I you know my story has been kind of like a make it make it happen kind of thing a I little like that. looking for the opportunities wherever they can be um because i originally grew up in ohio and uh in, outside of cleveland and very different landscape than a major city <laughs> and i was the type of person that just looked for what where can i do it i need to do it i'm obsessed with engineering and sound and ever since i was 12 um i had at that time put out a little like uh i put out an ep on itunes that i had like fully multi uh multi-track recorded and uh and everything did the art and did the whole release it sucked of course but um since then i just been obsessed there was no other option in my mind um so you know you talk about of, of uh musicians believing in every which way that they can do this and seeing a path i'm all about the like do it like you're starving for it mm. and live that you know um because that's how it's been for me you know there was never there was never a don't it was always do um so you know uh, ever since a kid i've just been looking for the opportunities i've done stuff in theater sound to sound for picture and i just couldn't shake music because i'm a musician um and uh you know i, I ran a really cool studio in Cleveland. It was a 115 year old school gym. It was so cool. It was one room. Um, there was graffiti on the walls. It was just, it was wild. Um, original, like old, old flooring drum sounds were amazing there. Oh, I bet. Um, so I had that, I, I ran that place, uh, for about two years. I think I was like 18 to 19. And then, uh, then I came out to Los Angeles and started working with Joe and, uh, and I, have learned so much, you know, I think a lot of my story uh, to where I am is, is being an assistant to an engineer, mm. uh, to a, a veteran accredited mixer. Um, and really kind of where my passion is with, with understanding on how to grow a career and how to teach people how to earn a place in a music industry career. Very you know? interesting. You know, uh, cause there's a, there's a traditional like upbringing of, of the multi-room studio, the runner to the assistant, you know, the whole, I mean, intern, runner, assistant, engineer, you know, all those things that, um, that still exist. And it's kind of like necessary to, to, to understand the way things work. You know, I think, sure. um, in life and a lot of, uh, our careers, we're always like, what's the right way this is supposed to go. Where's the instruction manual. Um, <laughs> story of my life. Know, you know, we, we don't always know what's going on and we're always looking for, how do I do this? What's, what's going on? And, uh, and I think for me, the path through that has been, uh, looking to get like earn respect, give respect and learn, you know, like earn your place in a room, um, which I definitely struggled with when I was younger, you know, I was just a little like kid that was like, Oh no, I gotta do this. Hmm. Um, but as I like kind of put that down to myself and, uh, and really just kind of open it up to it. It's amazing what you can learn when you just like look around at everybody in the room, like, whoa, that's so cool. You know, like yeah. I was just talking to, you know, amazing engineer friends yesterday. I'm like, dude, how do you get that snare sound? Like, you're so damn good at that. What the hell? Oh, man. Uh, 
Because I, I can't beat it. They're, they do what they do better than I can. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, so so my my journey has been defined by uh, trying to stay adjacent to those that I admire and uh, and respect and learn and uh, and just keep climbing up the hill. You know what I mean? Well, you're doing a great job at that. That is a phenomenal, probably one of the best uh, histories that anybody on this channel has ever given. Given you Ooh. went through so many different points. You 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 stole all like half the points on my list of the talking points I was gonna bring up. Bring up, <laughs> but I was like, shoot, this guy is very thorough, and I appreciated it because like sometimes you know people don't always give all the backstory, and you did a really good job because it brought up some really great points that I want to talk about. Um, one of them being you you mentioned something really distinct. You said you you went the traditional route. Of the music industry and i would love to hear more about that and what that means to you and like what do you consider the traditional route and how you also got there yeah i guess you know it, it wasn't even i was kind of a traditional adjacent um because i never i never assisted anywhere i for, for back so backstory i never went to college for school uh for college for school college for engineering uh never assisted or never ran for any studios i was never a runner at a studio Actually, let, let me from, pause you really quickly. For the people yeah. that aren't super familiar with all these terms, can we can you break down some of these terms, the runner, the engineer, the mix assistant, yeah. just so that they can follow along in this story if they're relatively new to the, the industry? Absolutely. Yeah, so a runner is uh, essentially, it's in the name. Um, you're kind of the errand person at the studio. So yeah. imagine a multi-room studio. You've got, say, the let's go big, go home. Let's say the Rolling Stones are in one room. There's ASAP Rocky in another <laughs> room, and there's you know Jack Antonoff in another room. Um, the runners are just checking in everywhere. They're on call to go get somebody wants a smoothie. Okay. Reception says you need to go pick up lunch for so-and-so you need to move all the baffles from studio A to studio B right now, all of that stuff, or you need to clean the toilets. All that stuff is runner. Um, you don't, it's not glorious. It's not creative. Uh, it is you proving, well, no, let me, let me put it this way. It's you earning the respect and, uh, earning your place in the room. Yeah, putting in putting in the time, right. essentially. Yeah, putting in time, getting familiar with your uh, environment and atmosphere. Um, an assistant is where that begins to become more engineer. You are assisting an engineer. So um, a good engine, a good assistant engineer is is kind of a silent ninja in the room. You know, you're you're aware of everything that's going on. You're like, okay, there's we're going to we might need this microphone set up in two minutes because they mentioned something or oh, the engineer said they like that take or somebody said you're writing that down you're kind of just like guiding the uh the session in this very quiet non-intrusive way you're helping the engineer do their job um there's actually a really really good book called the assistance handbook that i hold on i'm gonna grab this book yeah because this thing will teach you a lot assistant engineer's handbook wow it's pretty sick very very cool um will teach you a lot about being an assistant engineer and it's it's a lot of in between the line stuff i'm really passionate about that because it's such a cool art and will teach you a lot but then going up the ladder um then you got your engineers they're the ones running the sessions uh, essentially more or less hand in hand with the producer they're the ones the technical creative liaison from the producer to the session um and with the right assistant engineer you can really get some great stuff done and have a very fun fluid session that satisfies the client the artist the producer um yeah so so that's just like the short hand absolutely up um, yeah i appreciate you breaking that down for, for yeah those that yeah are and let me know if there's any other absolutely any other things so continuing along what you were mentioning you you said you start you didn't start the traditional right well you didn't go to college for all this stuff can you take it from there uh -huh. so didn't go to college i i ran the studio I mean, I had been engineering sessions in, in high school, uh, just trying to mix anything I could. You know, I I was wielding Pro Tools like a sword. <laughs> it was like, what can I possibly do? How can I get any opportunity in front of me? How can I do it? Um, and then fortunately, the the band I had, uh, I was like the, I was in the band, but I was also that like George Martin fifth member. Like when we do our records, we uh, rent the studio out for a lockout and I would engineer everything and we just like sleep upstairs and work till 3 a.m. And um, I ended up taking over that studio when the owner went to New York and he and I became business partners and uh, he's lives out here now, fantastic producer. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he gave me the opportunity to take over. 
So I ran this, I took on a client list of about 350 uh, and engineered there for about two years, just kind of did my thing. It was everything from, uh, it was a lot of vocal sessions, which I think is the way everybody should uh, cut their teeth is do a lot of vocal sessions, a lot of vocal sessions um, for the psychology and mm. the technical state of it um, and the speed. I mean, just like all of it is very integral. Um, so that's where I got good at being fast. And I say that because uh, when I transitioned and I, I was looking for work, uh, when I moved out to the West Coast, um, I connected with Joe Zook. And uh, it was really the ability, speed, and things I learned from having engineered solo sure. that got me in the door. Yeah. Um, I believe there was a Pro Tools shortcut to do an edit that I did that was faster than the one he knew. Um, and, and that was enough to get me in the door. Um, so, you know, something small like that can really do it. And, and that comes from having to cut out four bars from the second verse a million times. And I'm like, okay, how can I do it faster? You know, what's the fastest? Da, 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 da. Uh, so it kind of sounds, and let me know if you agree with this. It kind of sounds like your story you had mentioned almost essentially creating your own luck, creating your own opportunities and, and or jumping on opportunities when they're presented, right? Um, and a lot of people say, what is that that common phrase that that luck isn't isn't found, it's created or something, something along the lines of, you know, people that have success, they don't find luck, they create it, right? Um, but it almost sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is, and let me know if you agree with this, is, is just essentially putting in the hours. I think that so many musicians, myself included, when I first started, I'm super guilty of this when I first started off. I was released my, I've been in the industry now for about eight years. I dropped out of college eight years ago to the music full time. Actually, just around this time, I dropped out of college. <laughs> and uh, so I'm coming on my eight year anniversary, right? Um, and I, I released my first single. I thought I was going to be playing Madison Square Garden the next weekend, right? And obviously, it's taken a lot longer than that. And I've been cutting my teeth ever since. But like, you know, as things pick up, you know, you, 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 learn a lot in that process and to some degree i'm grateful that the next weekend i wasn't playing madison square garden because of all the things i would have been so underprepared right um and i think that that so many i think that speaks so i hope what i want to write the reason i'm trying to reiterate that is i I think that so many people want to skip all those steps but if you look at all these people's careers they didn't skip these steps to get to where they are you know they they just want to be mixing in that that pro level studio with the rolling stones and jack antonoff and you know asap rocky like you mentioned but there were so many steps that all those people that are in that room took to get there and if you'd mm-hmm. skipped all the steps you'd be highly underprepared exactly and and that's underprepared is the key word and i had actually just finished this uh new book from quincy jones called 12 notes i think it was um just came out and he he talks about the exact thing that you and i are are kind of swimming around which is uh you have to be prepared for these opportunities you know creating luck is is intangible um (laughs) but being prepared for opportunities is is that that's creating luck that's creating the i'm ready to receive the luck the opportunity when it's there yeah and that's yeah that's the ten thousand hours yeah for the thing you can't anticipate you know just preparing and getting really good It's something that you know you love and you know it is a thing out there and then gravitating and and pushing your raft towards the right buoys and try and towards the right islands so that if someone spots you, they're like, okay, here, rope you in and you're ready to swing your ready to get there. And to some degree, I I've noticed in life that it's not always the thing you're looking towards or working towards that's the opportunity. So it's almost being open to whatever opportunity presents it as long as you're prepared. You think you're preparing for one thing, preparing, 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 and the side opportunity comes that you would have never expected. But because you're preparing with your eyes set on that over there, now yeah. this opportunity, it's, it's just very, very, very interesting how life works out. Yeah. And, 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 and it's, it's kind of beautiful to just let go of the outcome. hundred percent. Yeah, you know, like expectations can play guys. I know they do for me and uh, letting go of that and following what feels right, um, especially in a career path. You know, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to be a certain place and hmm. uh, be a certain point, you know, like the Madison Square Garden things, uh, you know, and I've had it in my own career of like, oh, I need to be here and here and here. And it's like, man, we're all doing so great at what we do at our own pace. Uh, like, w- it's so ever important no matter what to yes, chase uh, your ambition, your drive, your goals, 
but also chase your happiness. A hundred percent. Enjoy, like, just, you know, like, screw I couldn't it. At the agree end of the day, more. like, enjoy. Yeah. Do what you enjoy. Oh, I could not agree more, man. Absolutely. And I think that one thing I've been trying to focus on more and more is while I am working towards those goals, I think that uh, it's so easy to forget that the journey is everything. You know, because when exactly. you get there, you play in that show or you play, you're mixing for this artist that you, you work towards your whole life and you're finally there. But the past 17 years was miserable. Like, is it really worth it to some degree? Like, exactly. I don't know. I, you know, and, I'd rather and, and, I'd rather almost never get there, but enjoy the process of trying to get there the whole way. Exactly. Well, you know, it's it's something that I'd never heard people talk about coming up that I kind of feel like I need to say more and more is like. I love mixing. I love doing what I'm doing. It, it, I, it's so fulfilling, but I have to prioritize time to go on hikes, to get outside, to go, you know, I disconnect so that I can come back and love what I do because I get burnt out. Mm. I work really, really hard and I'll fall out of love with it. If I'm not, re it's like a relationship. You can't see your person all the time. You got to have space away. So Very you look interesting. At you remember like, oh, wow. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. and that's what I think the relationship, especially music and creativity, is that it's very important for us to have a healthy relationship with the art so that we don't hate it. You know, all of us who get to work in any capacity of music are so lucky, so extremely mm -hmm. 100%. lucky. 100%. Um, that I think it's kind of like a, it's like a gem. Like, protect it. Take care of it. Take care of that relationship. Um, and if you have the perfect balance, that's wonderful. For me, I've, I've found... Uh, I can hammer out mixes after mixes, but then I still just want to go play guitar or play with synthesizers or drums that don't have anything to do with music, like work. It's so just like just letting the music out and there's yeah. no pressure. And I think, uh, you know, it's just kind of fulfilling your soul of what are you doing it for? What's the success for? What are you chasing? What are your goals? Uh, and then when all that's off the table, like, how are you satisfied? You know, what's yeah. your pleasure in music? Absolutely. And I think one thing that's super important in line with that is also not putting this pressure on yourself in those moments. I think that so often we can judge ourselves for those moments of wanting to go on that hike and want because we, we have these goals and we're like, well, if I'm going on that hike or if I'm spending time watching this movie, I'm not working towards those goals. And it's like this really counterintuitive thing, but it's like, sometimes we just need that. And it's almost like, like you said, a relationship. If we keep spending too much time there, we're going to, destroy yeah. the relationship or be unhappy in the relationship like you said yeah that's and, a great analogy the a relationship analogy yeah and it is i mean it's something i've struggled with for years i'm finally getting to the point where i'm finding the balance uh and luckily at a young age i'm developing these very early because i think everybody deserves uh you know some mindfulness and health to it um and it can just really fulfill you more it's it's like uh, Joe and I always talk about when we go on vacations or we go see our family and then we come back. Our those are always our best mixes because we're like, oh man, wow, it's I'm so excited to be off of my travel headphones and an airplane or somewhere else. And I get my monitors again, and I'm just so psyched. Yeah, you know, that is super like, interesting. It's preserving that excitement. It's sure, like, oh, I'm gonna go hang out and do something else tonight because I know I'm so excited to come back. You know, um, and forcing that perspective, especially when mixing, if we're going to do a technical thing. Uh, if you're spending hours and fatiguing your ears and you're like, I don't know if the snare should be up or down as the vocal rate, like uh, duh, 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 duh. just stop, go do something else. Yeah. And then maybe listen to it, check it on something else and then come back. And then you, you know, yeah. it'll be a little fresher. Let's transition quickly to mixing. I, I, want, I want to throw some mixing things in there. Um, yeah. What are three things that you think are absolutely completely essential for a mix? The most important three things. And then I want you to counter answer that with what are three things that people think are super important that actually really don't make any difference in the mix. Interesting. Interesting. Um, okay. So first one was three things that I think are most important. Yeah. That might be undervalued or that just are just in general. Uh, first thing that comes to mind is center image. Um, headphone era has kind of changed the dynamics of mixes and where things sit. Hmm. Um, I still really believe in having a strong center image. It, it, it can depend on what you put there, but something that feels like there's a focus to the center. Um, also bouncing off of the word focus, frequency focuses. Things that feel like, you know, your S's and your vocals are hitting the same places as your hi-hats, you know, things that feel like it's focused on 
resonances. Wow. Uh, and third thing that I think is very important is is depth, creating things, complex things that are barely heard but add to the background if you need it. Sometimes you know there's a lot of like great lo-fi stuff that's super dry. Um, you can create intimate, depthy things still in that, but uh, just think about not just here but here. You know. Yes. That's a great and, aspect, yeah. That's pre-delays, that's reverbs, that's all sorts of different stuff. But just explore the space, as Will Ferrell said in the cowbell, cowbell sketch. <laughs> exactly, uh, though. It's true. Yeah. And and to, to add on that, I, it's really interesting. I, I feel like it was Jack Antonoff, speaking of Jack Antonoff, like you mentioned earlier, that said in an interview once, like, he's like, putting in these sounds, he like, loves putting in these sounds that you might never, ever hear until ever, one, or two, until your thousandth time listening to the song. And, uh, you know, as somebody that loves music and as somebody that listens to a lot of music, it's interesting when you go back to some of your favorite songs and be like, oh my gosh. Like, one of my all-time favorite band is The Fray. You know, yeah. like How to Save a Life and Over My Head. I was just yeah. listening, like, last week. I think I think it was I think it was How to Save a Life. Yeah. And I never heard that there was a xylophone playing that main piano melody along with the piano. And I was like... Really? Or some sort of, like, you know, t- thing like that. Like, xylophone yeah. or whatever kind of instrument like that. Some sort of bell was like, whoa, I've heard this song on the radio a billion times, in my own headphones a thousand times, like, yeah. and here's this xylophone thing that I've, and it's, like, pretty far in the mix, like, you can, it's, yeah. like, pretty apparent, I'm like, how in the world did I never hear this? And I've had that so many times, too. It's so yeah. interesting. Well, and, and that's just the beauty of it, is, yeah. like, you're gonna find things, um, like, if we put in the work now, of fi- like, listening with all these different perspectives of different speakers, headphones, this and that, um, the one time somebody might listen on the AirPods in the right space where they might hear the right <laughs> resonant part of the mix. Exactly. We're like, oh, there's there's a new acoustic guitar in there I've never heard. What exactly. Nope. It's just it's fascinating. Uh, and thinking that way is never bad. Now, I mean, I'm not advocating necessarily for add so many things that you know you then densify something that doesn't need to be. Um, but just think about like working with I don't know explore the space of less and then expand and learn to work with what you have and yada, yada, yada. Absolutely. Um, okay. Did I, did I get it? I think I got a third Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Okay. So now, uh, what was your next one? Three you things that people think are very important that you would say are not very important. That's an interesting question. Um, hmm. Always having the bass really loud or like always having a very present bass. Um, and I actually, I'll expand that to always having like everything audible kind of in a way, um, like think about your context of is, is Hmm. 40 Hertz really what is going to serve the emotion of the song or is it going to feel much tighter and much boppier if the resonant notch of where the low end is building is around like 120, you know, emotionally. Um, stylistically genre based what is that going to do um another thing i think a lot of people do is uh always a reverb and a delay on a vocal or like you know going with generic i don't like template work i don't Mm -hmm. start from a template i have like presets of effects change that i've like built and then saved and then pull back out and i know exactly how they work and when they apply um but that's that's like saving all my colors on a palette ready to like paint you know um because i think uh it can be very easy to get stuck in like a oh well there's always going to be a valhalla vintage verb um and always this you know cla vocal or this this, it goes the exact way that's great if you're like producing your own stuff and like you need it to sound immediately like your sound great do not stop doing that because that's flow um but don't Mm -hmm. feel i feel like anytime my, I guess my advice would be anytime someone's thinking of something that they feel like they should do, like, oh, well, yeah, you just do that because that's the way it's done. It's like, no, just just stop stop that. Or like use this as a practice. Just stop yourself right there and say, well, what shouldn't I do? Or what would I not expect myself to do? You know, if I'm going to grab this reverb, what if I just grab a J37 like pl- uh, tape emulator plug in and just like turn off the slap, de- slap delay or something like that, spread it out, or you know, grab a, another delay and like turn up the diffusion, work with the diffusion and the size on it, 
and then get more of a like diffused delay thing instead of the reverb that I always go for. Yeah. Explore space. Um, okay, what else? What else? Speaking of, always... of super quickly adding on to that, I've been noticing yeah. a lot in mixes lately, essentially just what you've been saying in the sense of like, oh, you think every mix needs, you know, delay and reverb, right? Or every vocal. And I've been noticing more and more and more the use of dry vocal, not dry, dry, but like very clear vocals in very. a very big mix. And I'm like, wow, that's super different than typical. Like it, like there's been a lot of in the past, I would say year I've noticed like, wow, everybody's mixing very, very dry. And it's just different than what you'd think. Uh, you know, you yeah. think you need a reverb and a delay and they're not doing it. You know, and these are some yeah. of the biggest tracks. It's just interesting to kind of like take note of certain things. Yeah. The past like four years or so, I remember hearing more and more of a shift of like, wow, we're getting more sparse and tight. Um, it's really, really cool. Uh, I really admire that. I think that's really bold mixing and, and requires some cool space shaping. Sure. Um, There's not much to hide behind at that point. So you got every, no. everything clear. No, good. you got to get, you got to be a good engineer. You got to record things well, I believe. Uh, uh, or know how to like, you know, work your things together in the clay. Um, I just thought of another good one. Uh, things that people, oh, always blasting uh, compression on vocals. Uh, you don't always need to compress something um use your ears first would be my advice um understand what that understand what the thing you're putting on <laughs> you know? uh i i have will be the I first to admit that what what was that? Was that sorry? i'll be the first to admit that as somebody that's like you know i'm relatively self-taught in, in engineering yeah i've been doing this for at least i don't know at this point 10 12 years but like when i first started i knew nothing right so like oh i need to they say to compress vocals okay well i don't really know what a compressor does so i'm just gonna throw it on anyway <laughs> obviously and i've the, learned the same thing like it's it's when i'm working fast i'm not i'm not like listening I'm, like, I'm thinking, sure i'm not listening you know sure and uh and that's why like coming back to like the making space for stuff when you slow down and you just like listen especially with something you enjoy <laughs> then you uh you get to hear it and you're like okay well and i i have faders in front of me here at my desk uh so i'm like writing the fader of like balancing the vocal and i like if i pull it down it feels like it's popping out you know i, I find the sweet spot of like okay yeah it does need a little compression to mm. like work the rhythm of it um you know for it to like move with the song um but uh, yeah i can usually i know when i'm in a flow of oh i'm not listening i just put on three plugins that like we're just like band-aids on a bleeding arm, you know, <laughs> like just bizarre choices. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, another answer would be using compression, using really anything without knowing what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, try that yeah. stuff out, put all your compressors on one vocal track and switch them and listen to each one. Wow. That's a great tip. So it's so very easy. You know, I yeah. did, a sh I did a shootout with all of my, 1176 plugins i was like okay what are the differences of how they sound how they react the same setting same gain reduction yada 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 so that i know and i make notes i have a note on my on my desktop of all of my different choices for different high pass and low pass filters and how they resonate and the feeling of them and how to choose them and uh in wow. case i ever need you know, forget i go through all of my favorite things and i'm like okay so how do they work what do i know uh about them because all we do is we learn the technical stuff to so then be able to, you know, you learn. What's my analogy? I had an, I'm full of analogies. It's terrible. Uh, no, I, I like the analogy. I started a garden this year. Like it's stupid huge. Yeah. Like I, a lot of what I do is in either extreme. So <laughs> I have this extreme list of gardening things. Like it's now restituto grocers essentially because I have can literally supply whatever we, anybody needs. Love but like that. now my whole life is through the analogies of gardening. So like, I'm, I'm an analogy, uh, you, know, you know, I'm right there with you. So yeah. continue well, I was, with your I was going to say something along the lines of uh, like you don't, you learn, you learn how to use a screwdriver or a drill once and then you're not thinking about it. You're like, okay, how can I apply this? Yeah. What can I do to, you know, you lose, you, you use a tool, you learn a tool not to think about it. Yeah. So, and, and that's how, that's when your art really gets to happen is because I'm not, you know, I said, I, when I'm not thinking, I'm uh, in a weird spot or when it, rather when I'm thinking, yeah, when I'm thinking about something, instead of using my ears, I'm in a weird spot, but that's part of it. Is it like you have to get your technical abilities to a point where you can do them fluidly. 
yeah. passively. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not thinking about how does this work because you've already put in those 10,000 hours. You know exactly what it does. So when I'm thinking of, oh, this needs uh, this certain sort of, you know, just a little bit of, you know, I, it was, I was working on a mix right before we jumped on here together. And uh, I needed the snare drum to just be a little like, eh, just kind of back off a little fuzzy, just a little like, ah. Um, and I knew the right cassette plugin to use. You know, out of a few of them, I know there are different characteristics of ones that I like. And I know that I just slap it on. I already have a, a presets, my starting presets made. So I just open it. I know exactly where it's hitting. I adjust a little bit of the gain to, you know, go in or out or a different something general setting. And I know it's there because um, I put in the time to understand each tool that I'm using. Yeah, I really like plugin that. Comes out and we explore. Uh, it's like a new hardware or plugin. If you get it, the first thing you should do is take every knob, dime it. All right, duly noted. Next one, dime it. <laughs> okay, dime it. What does it do? Um, you know, and I, I've got some hardware. I have this one hardware box that uh, has no knobs or anything on it. And it's just like, how hard do I hit it? Okay, where's, okay, interesting, different sweet spots. What yeah. am I sending to it, you know? I kind of like those plugins to some degree the most because then it's just like, you don't have to think about anything. It's like, does this sound good? Okay, it'll need a little less, a little more of it, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you get lost in the knobs. There's too many knobs that you're like. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I am, when I'm in the flow, uh, that's why I've made so many starting presets because I'm yeah. like, okay, I know I'm going to grab this tool to do this thing. What's the path of least resistance for me to get the job done on what I'm trying to achieve? Yeah. So um, you mentioned two different things actually at the same. So you mentioned you talk a lot about plugins, but you also mentioned that you have faders. So do you mix in the box with faders, or how does that work for you? What are you doing? Yeah, I'm hybrid. Uh, so I have eight faders. I have an uh, Avid Artist Control or Artist Mix in front of me, um, and then I have some kind of esoteric outboard gear that I use for certain flavors, just stuff I've really fallen in love with that are all were made several generations before i was born um you know stuff from like 1959 or 79 wow, cool. um i think that one's from 79 as well stuff that just i i hit it a certain way um and it does exactly what i want you know i have a reverb that just sounds uh it's not for every song but when i get it i will often out loud yell at how excited mm -hmm. i am about it because i love it so much sure um, it's usually after like two coffees and I'm starting a mix and I'm just so stoked <laughs> to be doing it. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit of both, but it, primarily in the box, you know, after I finish a mix, even if I have hardware on there, I will print it into the session for archiving purposes so that I have it for recalls years down the road type of thing. Mm, very interesting. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> no, it's so interesting, man. It's so interesting to hear just like people talk about gear and stuff like because you know you you mentioned so many plugins including like ones like cla vocals and stuff like that you know like are you a fan of cla vocals do you use them or do you like have your own stuff or like um, it, continue say what you're about to say and then i'll, I'll ask about my, my follow-up question yeah go for it um so i i actually i really like the sound of it for certain things it's uh i don't go towards it as like a oh this is gonna cover everything sure um, sure sure but there's it's like it's like everything i know what i like about the tool like the uh there's certain sounds like if you want this really bright driven kind of rock and roll vocal, there's some settings I can do in there that I really like. I really like the uh, effects, just using the effects side, you know, the reverb delay, often the spreader, the spreader on that, like the widener side, the, all the way on the right setting yep. is really cool. Um, so oftentimes, yeah, if I hear like, oh, that would solve that thing. I'll grab it. All the tools are valid in the toolbox, you know? A hundred percent. Well, that, that's my point is like, sometimes I, I was talking to, uh, um, a, um, a mix engineer or he was actually a mastering engineer. Um, and he was talking about how he, uh, he, he was listing all these plugins that he's using. And I was just like, my mind was blown. Cause here he is. Are you familiar with Chris Garinger? I think I saw oh, him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was talking yeah. to, yeah. So I was talking to Chris, um, and he, I, my mind was just blown because I was like, wait, hold on a sec. You, you mentioned Fab Filter. You mentioned this. Like, these aren't crazy expensive plugins. You're, ta you're talking about average plugins. And here you are working on Grammy-nominated Grammy stuff. And I'm like, you know, me, when I was starting out, and even to some degree until he said it, I was like, I, you always thought you needed, you know, the top tier $15,000 plugin. When it's like, here he is just using a $200 plugin on a Dua Lipa song. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. breaking. It's like... and. What comes of that is learning after, I think your interview number like 90 at this point. So on all these different chats, I've learned the key thing is this been a couple, but one of the key things I've learned is like, it's not about, you know, 
what you use it's about how if you know how to use what you have you know and that's it it's like you could have the best gear in the world and i tell a story all the time when i was first started recording uh i got hired to write a wedding song for somebody so i was like okay i I gotta you know do something better than my cheap mic so i'm like you know i'm actually getting paid to do this right so i go out and borrow my friend's microphone like you know he's a korean musician's microphone and it was like way more than anything i could ever afford i plug it (laughs) in so excited to like record with it and it sounded like butt because i didn't know how to (laughs) use it and then I recorded on my like cheap like seventy dollar microphone, and it sounded a thousand times better. Yep. Not necess- I mean, looking back, who knows? But like, it's because I didn't know how to use his gear. So you can get yeah. whatever gear you want, but as long as you don't, like you said, if you don't know how to use the tool, you're not going to be able to fix the problem. I it, it's so true, and and I feel like uh, well, if, to feel it, that's not even the right way. I should start this. Uh, the one thing I think I I think everybody should explore is like using a CLA 76, the waves 1176 plugin has a different and its own sound than like the UA 1176. Yeah. I see a lot of people like looking at universal audio plugins, like, Oh my God, they're so much better. I mean, <laughs> yeah, they sound great, but like, I know that I can almost like hear certain sounds to when something's mixed exclusively on like waves plugins and it has a sound and it's cool. And it's own thing. And it's like, okay, well, like, how can I, how can I shape that? When is it time to use something different? That sounds um, like a blessing and a curse to be able to hear things like that at this point. It's it's just flavors, you know? Sure. Um, but, like, are you, you're hearing that stuff on the radio that comes on a playlist, and you're like, oh, that was mixed on this. Can you hear all that stuff at this point? Oh, no. I don't. At that point, I don't even care. I'm just, I'm just enjoying music. Sure, I, but sure, But, I mean, it's, sure. it's like there is a flavor. I know, like, when I get a session in from a producer, and I know they are, like, predominantly waves heavy, um, I know to kind of stick in that lane. I won't, like, replace things with something to get, like, a whatever different sound um but okay cool like that that reacts that way it has that thing sure um, so into that that's cool you know um it's it's very very small and this this also led me to another thought the all about shooting out things and understanding your tools um because joe zook and i were just talking about microphones recently we were talking about uh to your point of you know just because you grab the closest c12 or 251 or anything doesn't mean it's going to be great like you could listen to three different of the same, like three different iterations of the same microphone. And I'm talking anything from the best mic to a 57. Um, Joe was sharing a lot of information with me about when he did that. And we talked about uh, how different your 57s can sound. Mm. You know, you could, you could shoot out seven different uh, SM57 microphones and they could all sound so different that using number one versus number six could be the difference of where it sits in relation to your vocal and your mix. You know, all that stuff is, they're not all the same and you cannot know until you hear it Yeah, and you will become so much wiser. I mean, that's how you crack open your resolution of hearing is listen to more stuff, listen for what it is. And there's no right or wrong. I mean, it's like wine tasting or coffee. Like I'm a huge coffee snob and Mm. I love wine. Um, And I'm always thinking like, so does it actually taste like that? Is that how it's supposed to taste? Is that the tasting note? What? I'm like, no, dude, it's your perception. It's like, okay, if it, it feels like this, then you're right. Like that's that's your flavor on it. And that's what makes you a distinct engineer and a, and a mixer and a producer is by hearing something and saying, yeah, I think that that tastes like blueberry. Mm-hmm. I like blueberry when I mix it with, uh, you know, chocolate or something like that. Yeah. Well, I might be like, okay, I like blueberry and vanilla, but I see like game recognized game. And, and just because like our perception was different where it led us does not make you any, uh, you know, less that it just makes you you flavor. Exactly. Um, But it's very important to learn those tasting notes and put in the time. I can't believe I'm relating, mixing this much to coffee. Analogy, analogy king over here. (laughs) I love uh, it. I love my passions. What can I say? A hundred percent, man. I love it. So I want to take a step back and pivot back from mixing to your relationships. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you've been working with Joe for a while at this point. Um, I would love to hear how you, how that happened. How did you meet Joe? How did you go from working in Ohio to moving to LA and, uh, you know, creating these relationships? Cause I think that that's where so many people get stuck. They're like, okay, I've been doing this for so long, but I want to get to the next step. And they're like, how, how do they, get to that next step of creating these relationships with people that have more experience than them. Yeah. Well, and I should, uh, I should absolutely say, I mean, there's so many calls I've made and emails I've made that have failed, you know, sure. that's what we don't talk about enough. You know, there's been a lot of, I appreciate you saying that. I, um, I think that that 100% goes overlooked. 
Yeah, that's the, that's a big thing, man. When I, when I moved, especially from the Midwest to a big city, there's the whole like, Oh my God, you're like, woohoo off to LA. You're a big deal. Now it's like, no dude, I've been working hard. There's stuff that hasn't worked. I've been hustling. Like it it is not all fairy tales and rainbows and stuff, you know? hundred percent. Um, and, and everybody needs to hear that, accept that nobody gets anywhere easily or just jumps right in. But I think my, my story to how uh, Joe and I started working together is uh is really quite amazing and and joe is a relationship and a mentor that i cherish uh like family you know sure so um so it's kind of bizarre i i was sitting in a cafe in cleveland i'll give you long form because it's bizarre how this happened uh sitting in a cafe editing like video or something for dude a- all this coffee talk is like i need a second cup of coffee as soon as we get off i, I know thing. man it's, like it's you, really you mentioned like coffee like 10 times in the cafes it's, it's, and like I'm like, I need one. I'm like fiending for a cup now. <laughs> it's it's problematic how much it's involved in my life. Um, so I was sitting and someone sat next to me and they're like, hey, what you doing? Just start a conversation. I shared with them that I was uh, also ran a studio and looking to move to Los Angeles. I'm like, oh, I know a friend out there. He's an engineer. Um, and I'll introduce you. So I met up with this guy and uh, I was I was visiting LA at the time. This friend's name was Andy. Great engineer. Lives in Nashville now. Um we met up the same week that I also met up with Joe and I, I had emailed Joe's uh, manager um, and just happened to fortunately get connected. I think I just said enough uh, in the email that it was like, okay, he's serious. Uh, it was just a cold email. and I was fortunate enough just to get Joe's time and, you know, have coffee and just get to know him a little better. Um, but I met uh, with Andy. Another coffee time. reference. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, he's like, we should make a tally. Just, in the corner of the screen, just tally the amount of times Ross has mentioned coffee. <laughs> out the interview um so uh i met up with andy and we talked and uh he said you know who else you mean with i'm like oh you know i went up with joe zook and i was like oh well my friend ryan another amazing mix engineer in town still friends with ryan um he assisted joe recently as well in the past few years i'm like oh no way so that was that i realized i had a little bit of, of a web um fast forward you know months i had some more contact with joe and his manager uh and then i when i finally moved um, I was in the right place at the right time, hit him up and it was just the right timing that he needed someone. And, uh, you know, I had the connection of Ryan who I had, you know, fostered a good friendship with, uh, through, you know, a random chain. And then Joe and I have worked together for about five or six years now. Um, and, you know, back, back to like what we were talking about earlier about, uh, your relationship with, uh, your work, your mixing, is like a relationship with another person. I think, you know, we all need to put in um, good communication and respect for the people we work with. Uh, I think mm-hmm. one of the things I most valued about Joe that really allowed me to, to feel comfortable in the space is he told me early on something along the lines of, uh, you know, there's not like a power power dynamic. Like he respects uh, my perspective. We'll talk about things back and forth. Um, you know, I do work for him and I've had to earn the uh, respect of certain levels and, and climbing the ladder uh, with him. Um, but there was this mutual, like, okay, we're both going to show up here that was very welcoming. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and like, I've kind of hammered already, like being an assistant is the best way to learn. Um, it's the best way to learn how to just like, you know, whether I'm cleaning the yard at the studio house or just like learning to make the cup of coffee he likes really well. Um, coffee, tell you, uh, (laughs) it's. It's just the act of uh, of working hard to be in the space, and um, and then you know working with anybody is is you know what I've learned recently and been trying to apply is creating a team. You know, someone doesn't just work for you, but they work with you. You know, how can we do this together? Yeah. You know, um, uh, currently my assistant engineer that that is helping me with stuff. Sam, amazing assistant engineer. Talk about someone who's very diligent and on top of stuff. Um, you know, I try to foster a relationship of like, how can I help you help me? What can I do for you? Like, uh, I try to respect the space uh, that everybody deserves to have a healthy relationship with their work. Um, because I think there needs to be a bit of a uh, uh, a shift in the tide of, of how we hold our ourselves accountable to our these like consuming careers. I think that starts with the way we treat our staff and our people we work with sure. um, and and enjoying who those people are outside of just like hammering down records, you know, making time to sit and talk over lunch, making time to listen to records together or, you know, who are you as a person? 
you know, especially when uh, when you move to a big city and you're like networking and meeting people, it's always, oh, what do you do? What do you do? You know, essentially, how can you help me? How can you serve me? <laughs> I, I, I I've done that too, and uh, I tried to. I've just broken out of it because I want to ask people first questions like, so like, who are you? Like, what what's your what do you do outside of music? What do you what what makes you tick? You know, yeah. do you play like Dungeons and Dragons? Like, are you like a nerd? What do you what are you obsessed with? Mm -hmm. um, and and that's usually how I begin to click with people. I know how they function. And then like work is easy once you know how to communicate with someone. Yeah. Uh, you know, wow. Yeah. Absolutely. Relationships are are very important. Uh, other people are very important. Yeah. And and treating everyone around you very well. Um, giving into the well into into everybody yeah. uh can be a lot uh can really come back to you in a great way and that are not oh not only are the relationships important but like you mentioned like the, the relationship dynamics are super important too you know yeah. like the relationships that you keep with people and the health of those relationships those health that health is determined by the dynamics that you create within that relationship yeah be Absolutely. with people work with people be around yeah be around people and work with people that you enjoy yeah. like nothing will ever suck if you like the people you're around sure and that's a that's a journey Absolutely. that's that could be tough but like you know i have so many friends and people i work with now that i'm so grateful for that i've worked so very hard to like end up in situations with that uh it's really cool and it, and it will make you feel so great as a person you know work aside just seek the things that you love yeah the people you Absolutely. and then you'll make great art you'll be inspired to do things yeah and that's what's so cool is the opportunities are also arise talk about uh luck appearing is when you surround yourself with people that are primed on the same paths or inspirational hundred it's like you can mention one thing and they're like oh i was thinking about that we should do that and then yeah. you're doing shit yeah. you know yeah. it's it's amazing um so thinking like that is just like surround yourself and what you love and what inspires you and who you love and get inspired by Yes, absolutely. And then one thing I want to reiterate of the fact that when you were talking about meeting Joe and all the guys that you had met, the web, the interconnection of the web that you had met uh, with Ryan and Andy, um, I believe those were the names, I, I think. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, you, it was all this interconnection of the webs, but none of that would have mattered had you, and even the cold call email, none of that would have mattered had you not put in your 10,000 hours elsewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that that is super, super important. And also, I want to reiterate, I think your passion for music and your passion for mixing has been a, a really um, underlying tone of this whole conversation, you, like your, your love for it. And uh, I think that that's something people really need to consider as well in this career, because I get a lot of messages all the time, people saying, Hey, I'm consider, I'm, I, you know, I'm considering a career in music. Do you have any advice? And I'm like, part of me is like, like I'll give it the advice, but I'm also hesitant in the sense of like, if you're considering it, I don't know if it's really for you. Like, the way that you spoke, the way that I feel about it, it's like there was no other option, you know, exactly. and me, me and my wife have had conversations, not so much anymore, because thank God I'm not a starving artist anymore. <laughs> but like when the, we, I was and we were trying to get married or buy a house, it was like, hey, what if this doesn't work out? Like, what if we can't pay our bills because your career isn't going anywhere? And it's like, well, then I don't know what I would do because I, I was like, I don't have a plan B. I'm like, I'll go get a job at Starbucks if we need to. But like. I need to do this, you know, and there's yes. like, I I think that that's super important because like, it's a hard career. And you, like you mentioned, there's a lot of things, a lot of no's that you have to go through. There's a lot of, you know, hours and hours and hours. And I don't think that if you don't love it, that it's, you're not going to, you know, it's like almost like being a doctor. Like you are going to be miserable trying to go through your whatever, 12 years of school. If you yeah. don't really love it, you know, yeah, the way I, the way I compare it is, uh, I've been using this a lot. Um, for a lot of different applications recently uh around you know anything from artist development to like developing a career is um it's literally like you're starving now if you're starving are you going to wait for you know the filet mignon at the right restaurant cook the right way with a glass of wine or are you going to eat the cheetos at the first gas station you see because you're starving and you need the thing to just get you to the next one like do you want it can you live without this thing and uh and it's okay if you if you're like oh, I don't you know I don't really need to because that's great fulfill what you need in you. Yes. Um, I wouldn't hmm. suggest you try to like fight to the top of the music industry because it takes a, a bit of like getting smacked around and endurance <laughs> um, that you have to be committed to yeah. and uh, and that commitment has to show. Yeah. Um, 
in, in my experience and belief. And there's so many lanes of fulfillment everywhere. You know, it's, yeah. it's really like, what are you chasing? What do you, what success do you want? What does success, success mean to you? Yeah. Um, Cause it is different to everybody. And uh, I also want to start challenging people with like, is your success tied enough to your own happiness and joy? I completely you know? agree. Absolutely. You know, like a, a hit record to me uh, just means, okay, great. I get to work on more cool music that I want to work on. I get opportunities to meet more cool people and yeah. cool music. And it also means that I will probably can afford time off to go do the things I want to do. Wow. You know, yeah, that is essential. You know, yeah. like, we're not born to sit here and mix records all day, dude. Like I want to go see what the world has. Absolutely. Uh, man. And I think everybody should, uh, like, you know, I've said it a million times, own that, you know, do what Absolutely. you are fulfilled by. I couldn't agree more. And I want to add on to that by saying like, to some degree, you, I think it's super important to find, you know, reasons as to why you do things that aren't even tied to like, you know, very adding on to what you're saying. I'm agreeing with what you're saying in, in the sense of like, you know, some of my goals, it's so easy for me to get, Oh, I want to have a million streams on this song where it's like, that's really not my goal. You know, like it's so easy to get caught in that. But like, when I go back to the careers of why, I mean the, the, the cores of why I do my career, it's like, it's not so I get a million streams. It's so I can actually touch people with my music. And it's like, you know, exactly. focusing on that. Well, okay, did this song touch people? You know, okay, did it touch one person? As long as I'm trying to get it to touch people, it doesn't matter if it touches one person or a thousand people. That yeah. number is irrelevant or should be essentially <laughs> irrelevant. Well, you know, I, I look at it like uh, like asking yourself why. Why 100%. do I do it? Why do I want this? Why do I just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper? Yeah. Um, and find that authenticity. Yeah. Uh, cause I, I was listening to, to, to another podcast. I think it was Rick Rubin's podcast, uh, interviewing an artist about, uh, authenticity in music. And it makes me think a lot about like, you know, what are you making this song for? What is it? What's it saying? Yeah. Is it really true and honest? Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, when you, you can just hear in music when someone's channeling the thing they they need to make not just want to make you know not just like mm. i'm just gonna i just want to make this today that's valid that's great like do it but like those times when you're like i play this chord progression and i'm crying because it was what my body needed to hear you know that's that's the most incredible stuff to me i sure. love hearing it. and i feel to me i can hear that i can feel that and that's when that's when a million streams is like well yeah of course that's going to hit that because when sure. people hear that it's an undeniable truth um and and that's the human connection part of music and when you're true to that like who it doesn't who knows if there's a million streams that it will have but it, hell if you get fifty thousand, but each one of those change a life like come on what's like, it all about man absolutely quality, quality. yeah like like don't don't absolutely don't hold your value based on you know quantitative uh you know numbers on spotify like hold your value on on what fulfills you and connects you with people Couldn't you know? agree again more. like what are you doing it for yeah. put the value on what what are you doing it for absolutely man i couldn't agree more man you have uh i'm really excited to continue to watch where your career is going because you first of all are full of incredible truths and incredible experience so i'm excited to see where that takes you uh, i Thank really you. i want to be respectful of your time and i really appreciate you taking the time uh, if you could hang out for 30 more seconds, I want to say thank you to everybody that has watched or tuned in wherever you d decide to listen or watch this podcast. Appreciate you every single very much. Go check out Ross's stuff. He's worked on a ton of stuff. Go to his website. You can check him out on Instagram. All the links will be down in the description below. If you want to check out my music, it's the best way to support the channel. And I'll see you all in the next video. Have a great day. God bless and peace out.